bus and play Love Your London Have a banana In today's episode of Love Your London we visit the charming London Sewing Machine Museum and tell you a little bit about Tooting Commons and the fantastic Lido. But first, as you will have guessed from our slick intro, we want to tell you a little bit about today's station, Tooting Beck. Hello, welcome back. Sorry, there's been a little bit of a delay since the last episode. Uh, this is still the part of the Balham series, but as you would have seen just from the intro of this episode, we are currently at Tooting Beck, Tooting Beck Station, just down the road from Balham. Um, uh, sorry there's been a bit of a delay, as I said, we've, just, we've been moving house. Uh, this is also the reason why I'm wearing these really strange sunglasses, because I can't find my prescription sunglasses. Um, they're in a box somewhere. So these are the uh, sunglasses I got myself in Haridwar in India in 2017. They're a little bit manky, but they'll do for the occasion. Uh, the main thing here, we're here in, in sunny Tooting Beck in the borough of Wandsworth. Um, and, um, well, you, if you're fans of Finnish hard rock glam music, you probably know the name Tooting Beck already, because there's a band called Hanoi Rocks, and it is they who immortalised the name Tooting Beck in a song called Tooting Beck Rex, which was a, a, a song about the times back in 1983 when they released a song when Hanoi Rocks, the Finnish glam rock band, um, stayed in a flat in Tooting Beck and were fighting against the rats and everything. It was a rat infested flat in Tooting Beck and they, so they wrote this song called Tooting Beck Wreck. But it's not all, I mean, there's some fantastic things. I mean, Tooting Beck has really changed since those days, since the 80s. I think we're going to see a little bit of a difference as we move around um, and really looking forward to showing you a bit about this. Now, Tooting Beck Station has not only uh, given its name to a glam rock Finnish song, it's also, wow, out there. It's also given its name to a crater, a crater on Mars. So according to the International Astronomical Rules on Interplanetary Nomenclature, craters that are less than 60 kilometers in diameter are um, named after villages of fewer than 100,000 people. And the person who discovered it, Pete Muginis Mark, was born here in Tooting. Uh, because apparently the river valley next to the crater reminded him of Tooting Beck. Uh, the crater is 28 kilometers across and 1.2 kilometers deep. Uh, so to be honest, Tooting is already appearing to be quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's the only one that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that has given its name to a crater on Mars. How fantastic is that? So the word Beck actually comes from the words for stream. Um, Beck is an old Anglo sort of Norman word um, and it would mean stream. And that in turn comes from an actual river in Normandy called Beck. Um, so that's where the Beck bit comes. Um, the Tooting Bit, well that's a really old name, in fact it appears in the Doomsday Book, Tottinges, in 1086, uh, so that's, that's a Tottinges Beck, so it's a, it's a very old name, um, and of course this was a going concern, this here, if you remember our last episode on Balham, we spoke about this being the Roman road, this, is, this was Stain Street, of course now it's the A24, doesn't look like a Roman road anymore, but uh, this was a Roman road, so a major Roman thoroughfare, so, um, so long before before the Doomsday Book, um, this was this was basically uh, a, a going concern. It's always been a going concern. So yeah, two things back. Now, what more can we tell you about the station? Well, I think fans of our channel will know immediately that this is a Charles Holden design station. The original name of this station when it opened in 1926 was Trinity Road Brackets Tooting Beck Brackets. Trinity Road Tooting Beck. Uh, Trinity Road is in fact that road over there. Um, but in 1950, uh, I think it was the 1st of October 1950, if I remember correctly, uh, Tooting Beck uh, was just the name of the station. It, they, they dropped the bit uh, called uh, Trinity Road. Um, now inside the station, um, you'll see on your screen now, um, a very interesting clock. This is the other thing the station is famous for. And these clocks are made by the self-winding clock company of New York. Um, and the way they originally worked is that they were powered by batteries which needed replacing once a year. 
and the batteries would power a motor which would rewind the spring every single hour. So it's very, very high tech uh, for the times. And uh, as you can see, it's still there today, to this day. And you'll see uh, clocks by the uh, New York-based um, um, self-winding clock company all over the place in New York, Central Station and lots of other famous areas. Now, this station itself is in Zone 3. Uh, it's, on the, it's on the 24 hour tube network, which means that the lucky people of Tooting have got a 24 hour access to public transport um, on Friday, all night Friday and all night Saturday. Fantastic. Unfortunately, that's not the case for people who need wheelchairs. There is no step free access. So, our poor friend Kate, who is one of our patrons and one of our good friends of the channel, she'll never be able to come and visit this station. Well, she maybe will one day. Tell you what, Sadiq Khan. He was born here in Tooting. He was the MP of Tooting. He's our current Mayor of London. He should sort it out. I mean, he should get on the blower to, to, to Grant Shapps or, or whoever, you know, whoever's in charge of these sort of things um, uh, in, in Transport for London. I suppose he's in charge of it. Um, and try and make this station accessible because it's ridiculous that the, pe the good people, the good uh, wheelchair-bound people of Tooting cannot access this station. Now, funny enough, we are going to be doing a special later yeah. this year in conjunction with Kate, um, talking about accessibility um, on the whole tube network as a, as, as, a, as a whole. So look out for that. Do subscribe to our channel so that you are the first to hear about it. In fact, up there you can see the little subscribe button, like our channel because that's really, really important um, and, um, and share it on social media of course. Um, you can support us by, by on Patreon like Kate does um, or you can, uh, you can do lots of things. I mean you see all the little buttons all over the place, just, just support us, you know what to do now. Comment also because comments are really important on YouTube. Unfortunately also the other, the other bad thing about the station, there are no toilets, not for able-bodied, not for non-able-bodied people, no toilets at all. And again, poor show. There are pubs around. There are pubs. You've got the wheat sheaf over there if you need a loo. But it's not great. They need, they need also to cater for those who need toilets. Um, and so now, obviously, we are going to be talking quite a lot more about Balham in future episodes. This being Tooting. Um, and in a future episode, we're going to be going down Upper Tooting Road, which is just over there. This is the beginning of the Curry Mile. But first of all, we're going to go over there because we're going to show you somewhere that's going to have you in stitches. So we are here at the London Sewing Machine Museum, part of Wimbledon Sewing Machine Company Limited. Um, and so this is a little hidden treasure. It's free, so people of London, come down. It's open on the first Saturday of every month. Now, because last Saturday was part of that whole Jubilee extravaganza, it's actually the second Saturday uh, this June. But uh, normally it's the first Saturday of every month, it's open between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. and it's completely free. Really looking forward to showing you some of the exhibits here. First of all, what was your name? Lauren. Hi. Your name's Lauren, yeah. and you are the... Um, the sewing machine supervisor. Literally, I have no staff. I supervise myself, and I'm the best <laughs> member of staff I ever had. Now, one question I did want to ask is because um, I know there's a controversy about, about uh, what uh, uh, sewing people call themselves. I know that there's the word sewer, but obviously that's written the same way as sewer. Sewer, yes. So, uh, a, lot, website, so a lot of people... The shop is Crafty yes. Sewer. Which yes. Is like crafty yeah. Sewer. And so I know a lot of people would like to try, to, to, to try and introduce the word sewist. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but apparently a lot of people hate that because it sounds... Is then they sound like a hobbyist and, they, and so they prefer the word yeah. sewer, even though it's hard to pronounce. Yeah. Uh, how, where do you stand? The controversy of seamstress as well. People don't like that either because it's... Sexist, seen yeah. as sexist nowadays, yeah. So I, as a non-sewer, or sewist, I don't mind. You don't mind. I don't mind. Call yourself what you want to call yourself and don't be annoyed with people who want to call themselves something different. Okay. But I'm with you that written, it does look like sewer. So yes. I probably would lean towards sewist, sewist so that you're not a sewer. Yes. <laughs> so that's where I would lean. Yes. But I do think 
just enjoy. This particular sewing machine was commissioned for Queen Victoria's eldest daughter's wedding in 1865, her eldest daughter also being Victoria, just to make my life hard work. Now, it was, um, it was commissioned by a German sewing machine company called Pollock Schmidt & Co, and it was gifted to the royal family in 1865. Now, I'm a big believer in probably this is the most ornate sewing machine you'll ever see in real life. Everything is carved, everything is etched. The spools are all old ivory. Four of them have a carving of the crown in the top. The glass case has an etching of the crest, and even the flatbed has a full etching of Windsor Castle. I don't know if you can get it on camera, but it is absolutely lovely. So before I ever saw this machine in real life, you kind of make assumptions in your head about what it's going to look like. And one of the assumptions I made was that the treadle was going to be really small because people were smaller back then. But those are the biggest feet treadles I have ever seen in my life. And I said to Ray, are they, were they damaged and, and added on? And he said to me, no dear. He said, they're absolutely original. He said, it, I don't know why they're, that, that, why they're that size. I just know they had to add the straps in because her little feet kept slipping out. So I thought that was quite sweet. Now, to be fair, we're not going to kid ourselves and say that the princess actually sewed on this machine frequently she I doubt she ever even did but when she had her first children they hired a nanny and the nanny used this machine quite a lot she used it to sew for the children and she used it to sew for the royal family and after many many years of loyal service she was asked if there was anything she would like as a gift and they basically she asked if she could have the sewing machine yeah, yeah. now when I first started doing this I had a lot of people say to me of course they did. of course you wanted the sewing machine it's a one-off it's you know never gonna get another one of these actually it stayed in her family long after she passed away so I'm a big believer in she fell in love with her first sewing machine which I think we all do now after she passed it stayed in her family for quite a while but eventually they came to downsize and I mean not many people have space for one of these in their house and it went up for auction and it went up for auction at Christie's. The story behind that isn't that interesting. Ray literally sat in his chair with his hand up until the machine was his. I hear there was another bidder, a German gentleman, and he bidded fiercely while Ray just sat there with his hand up. But it was always going to be Ray's because it's Ray's sewing machine. He acquired this particular piece in 2000 and basically built the sewing machine museum around it. It was the most expensive sewing machine ever sold anywhere. I probably shouldn't mention figures okay. until the Thermonier, which we will move on to. So basically, actually, when I first started doing this job, I was hired as security, which I was a bit like, if you're big enough and strong enough to run off of one of these machines, you can have it. This particular piece is one of the first ever sewing machines to have been invented. It was invented by a French gentleman called Bartholomew Thermonier, who believed you could make a sewing machine, a machine that could sew, basically, at a time when people didn't believe you could. Everything was done by hand, and everyone thought he was crazy. He spent most of his life and all of his savings getting to a point where he did actually make a machine that could sew. He made a couple of examples of sewing machines, but this particular one was the one that worked best. He got to this point at around 1839, but by then he had no funding he'd run out of money he had nothing so he decided to go public with his machine to very very <coughs> mixed reviews so you had the half of the world that thought this was absolutely the most innovative thing they've ever seen it's going to change the face of the industry it's great things but then you had all the seamstresses Now the seamstresses still did stuff by hand so they feared for their jobs they were worried that he was going to come here with his machines and he was going to take all their jobs so there's very very mixed reviews now he got the odd commission here and there but nothing massive but then he got contacted by a shirt factory in Argentina and they said to him is there any chance you could ship us a machine and an instruction guide if we like what we see we will commission you to make around 80 sewing machines so he was like okay wicked so he sent them a sewing machine and he sent them a guide they received it they liked it they contacted him they sent him enough money to produce these 80 sewing machines so he did he went into production now, the mm, story's going to get a bit tragic, do bear with me. Now, <coughs> a couple of nights before he was due to ship the sewing machines out to Argentina, a couple of seamstresses snuck in and they set fire to the factory with all the machines in it. And with the machines being made of wood, none, none of them survived. So, unfortunately, Thimonier had to pay back the shirt factory and any staff that he had making the actual sewing machines so he died a very poor man now 
eventually that particular shirt factory went into liquidation it ended up dormant and in 2008 an Argentinian couple bought the shirt factory to turn back into a shirt factory which I really liked I liked that they were going back to its roots so they signed all the paperwork to make it theirs and they went for a rummage and in the basement they found the thermonier along with all of his handwritten paperwork now he didn't exactly have an instruction guide he sent them pretty much everything he had on the sewing machine because he was so desperate for the commission so they found all of his handwritten work and the Thermonier machine. Now, at the top of the machine, it says Thermonier number four. We don't know whether that is the fourth ever sewing machine, like the fourth prototype, or whether it was the fourth one to come off the production line. But it says Thermonier on it. Now, like most people, because I had never heard of Thermonier until I started doing this, most people had never heard of Thermonier, so they didn't quite know what they had. They Googled it, and they realized they had something awesome. But at this point, they didn't know if it belonged to them. So they had to contact the people they bought the factory from to see if that included contents. When they realised it did, they got them to sign a bit more paperwork just to confirm that it was including contents. They then went public with the sewing machine. So they, they let everyone know they had this particular machine. <coughs> now, <coughs> Sorry. That's all right. Ray, being Ray, I'm not too sure how he hears about these things. He still calls the internet the YouTube. He managed to find out about the Thermonier, and he wanted it, obviously, for his collection. So he contacted them, along with I don't know how many other collectors, and asked if he could buy it. At the time, they weren't willing to sell. So they left it exactly 12 months or so and they then contacted all of the people that were interested in buying and told them if they would like to fight it out between each other they're welcome to and the highest bidder will win three years of negotiations <laughs> between all of the collectors it eventually became Ray's it was always going to be Ray's he is the protagonist in our story so when they found out it was going to be theirs they sent he sent his son out Warren to Argentina to go and collect the machine so he went there I don't know if you're interested down here the tall gentleman in the middle is Warren he's my boss who went to collect the machine and the couple on each side are the couple that found the actual sewing machine so he went there and he collected the sewing machine. Now, I spoke to him recently about it and I said to him, did you have any interesting stories about when you went and collected the sewing machine? He said, well, not really. He said, I thought I'd take the opportunity to go and have a little bit of a tour of Argentina. He said, I've never been there before. It was Buenos Aires. So he booked a four day holiday, a four day stay. On the first day, he went and signed the paperwork to make this machine ours. He then packaged it up and left it in the wardrobe in the hotel for three days, which I just find shocking. But, you know, luck will have it. Nothing happened to it. It didn't get damaged, it didn't get stolen. It was fine. And he brought it back. Now, my favourite bit of the story is that when they were going through the paperwork, the Monnier's paperwork, his handwritten stuff, they found out that the exact same day and month that Thermonier applied for his patent was the exact same day and month that Warren signed the paperwork to make this ours. So <laughs> it could have been 364 other days, but it turned out that the exact same day just happened. It just happened. So as much as I'm like he should have left it with them and signed all the paperwork on the last day of his holiday, it wasn't meant to be that way. It was meant to be this way. I can't remember the exact date, but I think it was July, sometime in July. But I just thought that was magical. And my favourite thing about the machine is that the first ever sewing machine ever to have been invented, which, might I add, still actually works, because when it came into our possession, Ray set it all up and checked it over, and it does still do a chain stitch, it's a treadle. I love that because the machines after that was all like the hand nonsense before they figured out how to rig it up to a table yeah. and and go hands-free so he was just so <coughs> ahead of his time and I just love it so it's now the most expensive sewing machine ever sold ever anywhere and it's only one of two that we know of so we have one and the Thermonier Museum in Lyon have one but oh. other than that we don't know of any others so there, there isn't even one in, yeah. in Tulsa Oklahoma Oh, no. there might be an <laughs> highly unlikely. That's unlikely. Have you ever been there or have been to? No, no, I've only ever been to New York. That, that's the only. That's the yeah. other. The other. The other big sort of like major yeah. sewing machine museum. museum I bet they'd, they'd love to have one. Oh, yeah. it's me. He gets letters quite frequently from people wanting to buy his yeah. machine, yeah. but it's his machine, so yeah. it's oh, never going to happen. 
<laughs> um, I reckon the Vatican probably have one. <laughs> the Vatican have everything, don't they? This particular piece is the piece we believe is part of the Great Exhibition. It was a Alan B. Wilson machine. Sure, it's it's yep. I can't really get good images of these. I'll try. I'll get it's it. Shiny. Yeah. Right. It's part of a nine-piece series. The Smithsonian have eight. We have one, but they want our one. Yeah. And I was oh, wondering I why. I wasn't sure if it was just because they wanted to complete their collection, but Ray said no. He said them and us yeah. are under the impression that because ours is the only one that's domed and mounted, it was part of the Great Exhibition, right. where as their eight weren't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. We want to take you in the direction of the Tooting Commons now, but we thoroughly recommend this absolutely free museum. Remember, it's only open on the first Saturday of the month. Lauren was fantastic, by the way, and had bags of energy and enthusiasm. The tour is very detailed, and we got to see some really rare and aesthetically pleasing sewing machines. We popped in to the Sewing and Craft Superstore a few doors down, run by Ray Rushton's son, Warren. A colourful array of fabrics and buttons awaited us, and we just had a very quick chat with Warren about how he coped during the pandemic. We were operating behind closed doors all the way through, wow. just ticking over. But, uh, but I imagine a lot of people were home. Sticking cotton, people were just wanting in yeah. droves for making scrubs yeah. and moss for people, so... Oh. Yeah, so, we, so that might have actually... So, so did you get... Yeah good business for making masks or? well we, we were sort of supplying anybody that wanted it um, right the way through and there's a group in Wimbledon that were making scrubs for GPs because they couldn't get the yeah, stuff all the time so yeah and we had a delivery of um, I think it was about 3,000 metres of elastic came in one day and um, within 20 minutes we'd sold half of it that's right it's crazy Yes. And Rosa Museum's only open the first Saturday every month. This is open every day, is that right? Or? Except Sundays. Except Sundays, of course. Yeah, yeah. Close Sundays. But yeah. yeah. That's brilliant. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed hear, hearing yeah. your story about going to Buenos Aires to pick up the Thimonier. That was that was. That was right in the middle of the Olympics. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, I was uh, because I do old cars for um, film work and all the rest of it. Yes. We, we had three cars in the closing ceremony, and there was a two-week break. Yeah, uh, while they rehearsed the opening ceremony, yep. which is when I went to Buenos Aires. Yep. And it turned out the day we bought the machine was the day that the patent was granted. Oh, first granted. So uh, yeah. it's quite a coincidence. Yes, no, uh, uh, Lauren told us. Oh, yeah. She is fantastic, by the way. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you very much. You're more thank than you. welcome. Thank okay, you thank you very much. Okay. Right, yes, yeah, so um, in the last episode, we were talking quite a lot about um, Heaver. This is part of the Heaver estate. Um, as you can see, all these properties are all a little bit extraordinary and interesting um so the heaver estate does alfred heaver who um designed this whole area um now in this street this is manville road in this street um lives a very famous artist probably i mean i'd, I'd like to say he's a national treasure he's certainly a tooting treasure he's a muralist he does trompe d'oeil stuff um his name is richard bagley uh, now he's not around at the moment uh but we will be visiting uh, him hopefully in a future episode he's going to be talking a little bit about all the interesting stuff he does um trompe d'oeil Faux finishes, um, and, he, and, he, and he has some quite a dark side to him as well. Um, so that'll be fun. So do remember to subscribe, um, and you'll get uh, you'll get some interesting information, and it'll be quite educational because this is an inter this is an educational channel. Um, now we're just going to head off now down down this road um, because we're going to go to Tooting Commons. Now note I say commons in the plural. Uh, most people call it. I think it's. Tooting Common uh, because of the station Tooting Common. We're not doing Tooting Common in this episode, we're doing Tooting, tooting Commons. And that's because there are two commons Tooting Beck Common and Tooting Graveney Common. Uh, so these two commons means that the area is called Tooting Commons. Um, so we're going to check them out now. Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson. Uh, this is called Dr. Johnson's Avenue. Um, and there is, it is named after him because this is where he used to hang out quite a lot. Uh, he had a friend, uh, an MP, Henry Thrale MP. He was a politician, obviously, he's an MP. He was also a brewer. Um, he even he ran the, the Anchor in Southwark as well. It's one of his many pubs. Uh, Dr. Johnson used to hang around here, um, drink with him. And so this avenue is named after him. This is Dr. Johnson Avenue. If we just turn around. 
Um, now, there is a slight possibility, um, there is no proof of it though, that the trees that are lining this avenue were planted to commemorate a visit that Queen Elizabeth I made here when visiting the local Lord of the Manor at the time. Uh, the layout is yes. original. Sure. The trees aren't necessarily yeah. that old. We will be seeing a, a very old tree shortly. Uh, but um, this this is this was lined and designed and and manscaped, personscaped um, at the, uh, in 1600, um, and it was to commemorate uh, a visit Commons. from Queen Elizabeth I. Commons, it's split in two. That's right. That's well, it's right. funny because this, this road, as 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 Sharon just said, uh, the Commons are split in two by this road. Now there was a campaign. Uh, an unsuccessful campaign to rewild this road. Uh, the, the council thought that maybe it would be doing quite a good thing by, by getting rid of this road, this thoroughfare, this rat, uh, what they call a rat run, um, and, uh, and rewild it, have it all grass. Sounds fantastic, but it was, there was such a huge out, out war, outrage by the local population. Um, there was a 70% of, uh, it was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, um, uh, campaigns to stop something environmental happening. Um, uh, normally it's the other way around of course. 70% um, of people who responded uh, said that they wanted to keep the road because otherwise it would have caused a massive uh, traffic problem. Um, 3,200 individual responses, 70% of them against. Uh, that was in 2016, so the road is still here. Um, quite an interesting story I think. But let's carry on having a little walk around and, uh, and see what we can find out in this amazing common. Okay, so we are here in one of the co two commons. Uh, it's lovely, it's so leafy. Um, and as I said, there's, there's so many old trees here. Um, uh, we, we were spe speaking just mo a moment ago about, the, uh, about Dr. Johnson's Avenue and the layout there, which, was, which dates back to Queen Elizabeth the first time. Some of these trees are millions of years old. Um, what? Millions of years. <coughs> the species may be millions no, of years old. No, millions of years old. Oh, okay. 145 million years old, to be honest. Ooh, Come and have a look. Look fossil. at this little treasure here. Ooh, it's a fossil. This is from the Jurassic era. era so, um, so, uh, so, um, dinosaurs will probably have munched on this. Here we go. Petrified. My golly it is. Look at that. Isn't it amazing? This was actually donated by Heaver. It comes from the Lower Purbeck bed in Portland. Uh, moved from Bedford Hill. As I said, dinosaurs were roaming the earth when this tree was there. They may have even had the odd Diplodocus or whatever, may have had, or Brontiosaur, I'm not sure which one, may have had a little munch from the leaves of this tree. A long time ago, and here it is. Large herbivore. Large herbivore, and here it is in the middle of tooting. Isn't like this that fantastic? Looks like, that looks like someone's taking a bite out of it right there, or had a rub. Dinosaur rubbing. Ow! Stop it! So here we are, this is the Tooting Beck Lido. Now you can pronounce it Lido or Lido. It comes from the Italian Lido. Um, in fact, we went to Lido in uh, Venice. Uh, there's a little island with a beautiful beach that we went to a few years ago called Lido. So you can call it Lido, but the English often call it Lido. Either way, they're both acceptable. Now this is the largest outdoor freshwater pool in the country. 100 yards times 33 yards. Um, and it's very famous because um, it's got all these multicolored changing huts, which uh, you probably would have seen as a screensaver. Um, it's been there since 1906. Uh, back then it was a tooting bathing pond uh, because uh, when, when this opened, people didn't have their own bathroom, so they'd actually come here to get clean. Um, <coughs> and uh, obviously now it's a, a swimming pool. It's open every day of the year, including Christmas 
Day and New Year's Day. In fact, every single Sunday, uh, they have, uh, and also Christmas Day and New Year's Day, they have a race that's uh, not open to everyone. It's only open uh, to, the, to the South London Swimming Club. Um, in fact, the South London Swimming Club have exclusive use of this pool in winter. Uh, the rest of the year, from April to September, it's open to the public. In April, it's only open until about 5 p.m. Uh, but then, up until then, then the hours get long, longer. Right now, it's open until 8 p.m. And it's it's just under nine pounds to, to to get in um and have a swim you can just walk it walk in and and uh, get a swim or you can order online um it's a fantastic place um it's cold water in fact on their twitter feeds they say every day what the temperature of the water is but it's never above 20 degrees obviously it's in the middle of winter it's freezing freezing i'm not sure what the temperature is today but if you want to see what temperature it is um while you're watching this it then just 17.8 i can read it from 17.8 well, That's if you, really warm. It, yeah, the, the lowest it gets is one degree, my goodness oh. me. Um, now, if you want to find out what the temperature is, then just check out on social media, hashtag SLSC Lido Temp, um, and to find out what the temperature is. We, we are hopefully going to maybe film in here in the future episode. So again, subscribe to all the liking and all the other stuff. Um, and Sharon is even going to have, hopefully, a little bit of a swim in there. Uh, uh, she loves her cold, wild swimming. Yes. Um, uh, but that will be in a future episode. Uh, but for now, Tooting Beck, here, we are, here it is. This is the end of this episode. Uh, we're obviously going to be doing another episode on Tooting and Tooting Broadway as well and Tooting Common Station uh, very soon. Uh, our next episode is actually going to be a little bit of fun. It's go we're going to be visiting the Gunpowder Plot Immersive Experience uh, made by the same people that did the War of the Worlds um, Immersive Experience. There's going to be a link in the description below uh, where if you want to see that. Um, so that's where, that's, that will be our next episode. Um, but... Uh, uh, for the moment, uh, this is Tooting Commons, and uh, see you in the next episode. Bye! From to Wimbledon, from Brixton to beyond, love your London, have a banana.